Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Distracted Spectrum. We have with us today a returning guest, the professor of the underground, the one who studies all the things that go rest in peace. Professor Archeo Death Howard Williams. He is up to bat, and this is the top 12 of his favorite sites as an archaeologist of all of the UK. Am I saying that right? Well, I'm going to do the island of Britain. I'm going to keep the island, island of, of Ireland Britain. out of it because there's a whole other, um, you know. Don't mess um, with the redheads. Just Yeah, I don't want to get into that. And there's a whole other discussion. But I'm, I'm certainly 12 of my favorite sites from the island of Britain. There we go. And so what is number one up to bat? And I know it's probably not Stonehenge. That's no, probably I'm, didn't I'm, make I am going to, well, you'll have to wait to see what comes up because there'll be uh -oh. some predictable ones and there'll be some unpredictable ones. But I was going to, the, when you asked me to do a top 10 or top, you know, number of sites from Britain, I thought what I would use is to, I thought there's well, so many I love and for different reasons, but I thought I would see what a recent book um, but called Secret Britain, published yes. by a popular archaeologist, Mar Marianne Ocketer, who has been on TV and she's done a lot of, you know, really prominent, po positive promotion of the subject of archaeology. None of this manure that, you know, pseudo archaeology nonsense. She does really good, reliable um, popular engaging stuff so she's produced this book called Secret Britain which goes on a clockwise journey from the far north of Scotland um, the, the um, Shetland Orkney right the way down the east coast and then around down to Cornwall then back up and she has, I don't know how many sites she has, about 60, 70 sites um, representing different times and different places and I thought I would see what she said and then pick mostly hers but then I had to think hang on she's missed out two I just have to include so I thought I would start so I've got 12 that are 10 from Marianne and two extras um, but we could probably do another recording with just as many great sites oh, and probably another one again but I'm going to start off with Invernessia uh, modern day Scotland and the site of the Clava Cairns because the Clava Cairns are very important and the reason they're important is they are a scheduled, protected monument by Historic Scotland. Um, they are um, a site which has been well recognised, um, a, a popular tourist destination. They've had it's a burial one, site, correct? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a early Bronze Age set of um, cairns, and they are now popularly known because they're on the Outlander tourist trail because. It's the site that apparently inspired the author who wrote the books that the TV series subsequently came from. And I've been talking about the Clava Cairns recently because even though I dug there and surveyed there when I was a student in 1998, 99, I think around that time, uh, with Professor Richard Bradley, who went on and published about the, the, the monuments, mm -hmm. um, now... People, there's been lots of international controversy because a, a lady came on holiday and took away a little pebble and some bits of tree from it. And it caused all manner of TikTok drama uh, discussing the ethics of um, taking things away. And uh, the point is, though they were small items, uh, the spirit, the, the, the principle is leave nothing leave but there. footprints, you know, take only photographs, yeah. you know. We have that discussion a lot in America when it comes to finding arrowheads and, you know, indigenous artifacts and things like that. Absolutely. In some of your more rural country areas, people will just collect them, not thinking nothing of it, not call and report it. Because, um, you know, who knows? They could have just picked up an arrowhead that was on a town that we don't know about. Um, exactly. And so there is, it's like, Yes, leave only your footprints, take pictures, report it, and you'll get credit, and your yes. name will be attached historically to whatever site this is. Exactly. It's bad enough when it's in a field, but it's and, and, and you find it in a ploughed field and it's, you, you know, you don't report it to the landowner, you don't report it to the local museum or the in in, uh, in in Scotland. They have slightly different rules. But the point is, there's always an authority you can report this to. Yeah. Uh, but what's really cool about the well, what's frustrating about the Clava is it's such a well visited site. It's, it's received uh, vandalism before. And so it's important we challenge when people do even the tiniest amount of damage, even though it may seem 
out of proportion. You know, it's really important. But the Clavacans are amazing. They're very close to the late um, the Culloden battlefield, wow. obviously the last major battle on British soil in, uh, um, in the middle of the 18th century, where John, um, 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 Bonnie Prince Tar- Charlie was uh, finally defeated by the government forces. And um, all manner of mythologies surround the landscape. But the monuments themselves are, are three of a broader landscape of tombs. But three are in the guardianship area called the Balneuren of Clava. And there are two passage graves, which means they're circular with central chambers going into um, a corbel roofed uh, central chamber. And they have a stone circle around them. So they're like a weird composite right. of passage grave and stone circle together and then in the middle between these two passage graves which are orientated on the uh, southwest on the midwinter um sun sun sunrise um i'm looking sunset, at them now yeah sorry in my way around my always get this wrong. Uh, the midwinter sun um sunset they are uh, uh, there's a ring can which doesn't have a passage and we d- we think these were used for burial uh, for um cremation and inhumation and, but mainly cremation, and um, they were in use in the third millennium BCE. So this is the the late third millennium BCE. So we're looking at the early Bronze Age um, in Britain. So they're really now, old, four and a half thousand the, years old. What's the landscape look like yeah. at that so time? This a, so this is this would have been a wooded valley. Um, so it would have been a, 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 near a major river. Um, um, it, it would have been um, a place where people came together for ceremonies, gatherings, but they would have been fishing, hunting, gathering and farming because for over 2000 years, people have been farming the landscape in Britain. The far- first farmers get here yeah. around 4000 BCE, so about 6000 years ago. And so these are you know, deep time farming communities. So they would have been hunting and fishing, but they would also have been farming in the valley. So they were probably living in and around the tombs that they were building for their ancestors. And we don't know who got to be buried in them. And we, you know, but maybe it's, it's not easy to say, oh, the chiefs were or the, 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 right. the top, do, you know, and impose all our biases of it would have been a male dominated society. It would have been, you know, we, we don't no know idea. all of those details. It's speculation. But we, we do think that maybe it would have been leading families who down the generations would have uh, buried the dead. But the, the tradition of Clava, because they used to be thought to be Neolithic, because they're very similar to monuments over a thousand mm. years older to 500 years older found in Orkney and elsewhere but actually right. the fact that they've been radiocarbon dated to the early bronze age means that they're even in their time they were doing something that people elsewhere had stopped doing which is using these tombs so probably they were they were kind of you could see that it's not about saying they're a bit backward it's just saying that they were doing something that everyone else thought was old hat fashioned and they were using right. building these tombs but it's a, it's a spectacular site on a on a little ridge, a flat ridge above the river. So it would have been well drained. It wouldn't have been flooded, but it would have been close to water and a place where people would know, be familiar with. They would perhaps be living there all year round. But some people would have been um, moving with their animals and hunting and going off and in, in, into and trading. And there would have been extensive trade by this point in copper and tin and to make yes. bronze host of other um, precious materials so these communities would have been well connected across the island and beyond but we don't know exactly the names of these groups it's all prehistory it's all before we have any written records so we can't that's what i was about to ask we don't know if this is what what group of people that this ended up becoming or was or anything like that no i think in popular in popular you know perception they're built by the picts who are the the people yes. who we know from the late third century through to the ninth century are the native people of northeast scotland and they're called the picts because the Ro- roman sources describe them as a slur as the pit painted people the which painted is a kind people. of saying they're so they're so uncivilized they they paint their bodies and we don't know if everybody painted their bodies or but this and this was um or this was just a slur aimed at them because they did something strange but we've there's we've seen all manner as you from the disney film brave you know we've all got all our popular, assassin's creed that's into yeah. some pictures yeah yeah we've all got our perceptions of the picked but this is over three thousand years uh, hang on, well, it's, yeah, it's almost yeah, 3,000 years before the Picts, right? But in popular perception, people say, oh, the Picts 
um, built these. No, no. But the, the twist comes that when uh, Professor Richard Bradley's team from the University of Reading, of which I was part, excavated at the cairns, the central ring cairn, they found a, creme- a scatter of cremated human remains outside the ring cairn and they radiocarbon dated it and it wasn't early Bronze Age. People had been coming back to these monuments in the Pictish period. So a local Pictish family sometime in the mid first millennium CE over two and a half thousand years, three thousand years after these monuments were abandoned, were coming back and honoring these ancient burial sites. And they so were using known. it for a long time. Yeah. No one would have known. Like we've got to remember, I know people say, oh, well, oral histories go deep. Nobody's oral history up outside of Aboriginal Australia. Nobody's oral history goes back 3000 years. So it's very no. unlikely that Pictish period peoples would have known a genealogy back to those times. What's more interesting is this is they probably thought these ancient tombs were really important because they were places where maybe they imagined were entrance points to other worlds. Maybe they thought of them as the residences of ancient kings and queens. You know, we don't know the folklore, but we can imagine they saw these places as important and were still going back there to on, uh, to place their dead. And so that's one of the things I love about the Clavicans and why it meets my top 12. Is because that makes it very, very, very interesting. Yeah, it's one of those sites, one of those prehistoric sites that gets reused in the early it's medieval period. And that's my period of interest. So I, right. I'm interested in the, the Anglo-Saxons, the Picts, the Vikings, the early medieval Welsh. That's my period. And I love the fact that those early medieval peoples were reconnecting to this past, even if it was a half, not even a half remembered, but a completely legendary past. These sites right. still have importance. And we see that it's in Ireland still... too. Right. Yeah. That's still a bridge. It like it bridges time periods together yeah. and it creates like, OK, there was there. Whoever was using this, there was a commonality that kept going, regardless if it was the same people groups or coming and going, you know, who, who cares? But there was some sort of commonality around this location exactly. um, that ties multiple time periods together. Exactly, and and that I, is cool. I, I don't know if it's if, uh, you're in charge, but if, may I be permitted to segue into my second favorite case study? Absolutely, um, because because this is with the picks, because and this is the first site that Mar- Marianne um, I'm all for the picks, book. yeah. And she picks this one, picks picks them from the picks, and it's about depiction. It's depiction of the picks because this this sto- um, this site is really famous because the picks are famous for their symbol stones, right? And yes. um, the there's many different types, and they continue in use from possibly we're getting earlier dates for some of the early ones, perhaps as early as the fourth century. So the late Roman period in lowland Britain, when the Roman province is still there, the Picts may be starting to carve these strange esoteric pictographs onto natural boulders and to newly erected stones, but also onto some prehistoric monuments. And so the, th- now, the site I want to go to... The Vikings know, did that as well, right? Now, would that did. have been something that they got from each other or or were they doing that before? Do we know? Is there evidence of... It's, it's yeah. It's, because we know different. they intermingled. Well, they all had... In- I mean, the, the ancestors of the Vikings are in southern scandinavia they're trading and and and, and right. sending soldiers to the roman world and i think both traditions are being influenced by the roman tradition of gravestones and so the romans the roman military in particular from the first second century in britain and the northwest provinces yeah are starting to erect not everyone gets a gravestone but particularly those that want to Important. be seen as Get, yeah, high status, but also aspiring to be Roman citizens. They're putting up gravestones in the Roman fashion. I think a, a lot of people then in the north of Europe are, over the centuries, this idea is trickling out. And mm-hmm. so we see in Scandinavia some very early rune stones with representations of horse horse riders and dogs. And it's like a hunting scene that you would find on some Roman tombstones or a cavalryman riding down a barbarian. So they're taking ideas. So I don't think it's necessarily the Picts were talking to the 
the people of southern Scandinavia who became the Vikings. But but I think it's more just they're all on the edge of the Roman world, not immediately on the edge, but they're all in contact with the Roman world. So I'm not saying they're just yeah. copying because they're too lazy to come up with an idea of their own, but they're creating these local traditions from from what they get from Rome. So the site I was going to talk about is Abilemno, and Abilemno has two amazingly cool Picture symbol stones. One of them is an early one, which could be as early as the sixth or seventh century, and Abilemno one is um, a class one picture symbol stone because it has no sign of Christian influence. It's simply these strange shapes, and it has a double disc and Z rod and a mirror and comb. And there's been a massive debate about what these symbols might mean. I will just say that one idea is that we may be looking at a pictographic way of, of, of names, of naming. Many um, Celtic and um, because the pricks are thought to be speaking a version of um, Brythonic, which survives in Welsh, Cornish and Breton. They weren't speaking the same language as the Welsh in this period, but they were a, a sister language or a, a, a cousin language different from Gaelic. And we think right. that the Picts, the Picts may have been like many Indo-European peoples. They had a two part uh, uh, f um, naming system, a two, a two syllable names. And the, the Pictish symbol stones don't always appear in, in, in combinations of two. And we think it may be names. We don't know what the names are, but like my name's Howard. It's a two syllable name. Um, whether you're called uh, Wolfstan, Finbar, Cormac, um, um, you know, all of the names we have from the early Middle Ages, almost and almost all are a two syllable. Um, not everyone, but it's it's a, it's a it's a commonality. So one idea that's been put forward is that these symbols are not only striking ways of carving on rock and they would have been painted, but they would also have been perhaps land claims for families or memorials to individuals. We don't know, but I think right. that's the best guess. And this early one, Abilemno 1, looks like it's from a period before Christianity is being formally adopted or at least is loosely adopted. Loosely, and because yeah. these stones aren't expressions of faith, they're, um, they're more perhaps expressions of land claims or commemorating individuals. And the comb and the mirror might be a way of denoting it's been claimed. I'm not convinced by this. A, a woman. So you may be looking at Although you see men are combing their hairs and beards too, and men are looking in mirrors too, so I'm not going right, to. Right. It's a bit of a old-fashioned assumption, but it's it's an idea that maybe you have the name and then you have the comb and mirror sometimes appears to denote a, a woman of standing or, stand, or a group um, that's led yeah. by a woman or something. We don't know. No. So <clears throat> Abilemno one is really cool, but the reason why it hits my top twelve is Abilemno two is later. And it is a yeah. cross inscribed stone and it's amazing. So this dates to a period where the church is established. Yes. And Abilemno 2, you've got an elaborate cross surrounded by, you know, really carved beasts that you of the kind you'd find on manuscripts, early Christian manuscripts of the late 17th yeah, century. It says that King David fighting, uh, fighting the lion is on here. So you have. But yeah. Do we got, do we know that's for sure that? No. How do we know that? Not uh, on is this that just one. a guess? I don't think we know that for this one. Um, I, okay. um, you, you, but you've got uh, King David fighting. Um, um, that, um, you got no. You got to, you got King David. You got Daniel. You got various other biblical figures are not very popular in Scotland. And um, on this stone, you've got um, Christian iconography and and beasts on on one side, but on the <laughs> other side. It's it, why it's so amazingly cool is you have a have a battle scene and it's been argued that the battle is not just any battle, but it's the it's a famous battle that happened in A.D. 8, uh, 685 between the East and um, the Anglo-Saxons, the the Northumbrians, the most northern of the Germanic speaking Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and um, the king of the pits. Um, and it's showing one group has horses and one group doesn't. Am I looking at the right thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the idea okay. is this is all a bit of a guess. And this may be carved a century after the battle. But one idea is that this could be a representation of the battle next in Smear, where the Egfrith, King Egfrith of Northumbria and his Anglo-Saxons have their asses whipped by um, um, Bridie MacBilly, the king of the Picts, and that the body being pecked at by a crow 
you know, is a is perhaps denotes the an Anglian warrior with his helmet on his horseback. Um, on the right hand side are the warriors right. who are beaten, whereas the Picts are the ones on on some on horseback, but also those those moving to the right with their bows and their uh, you know and their spears. I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're the victorious Picts, um, and it shows the retreat of the yeah. the other side. It's a bit of an exp- you know, it's an, but but this is no matter how much you can take that with a pinch of salt, it's so right. rare. So rare, and again above it, you've got a picture symbols, uh, um, a sort of rectangle with notch and a, a Z rod and a, a three disc symbol. Which again, we don't know what it means, but we can guess maybe that's a name. And what you're seeing here is a monument raised to commemorate an individual, a, a powerful chief or a woman of great standing. We don't know, and that the battle is therefore maybe her ancestors or his ancestors fought in the battle. You know, mm-hmm. maybe it's just a more gene- generic scene of military power. You know, we don't know exactly. Or know. maybe it's just, you know, hey, this is what happened. Like, yeah. these yeah. guys came, we ran them off. <laughs> exactly. And, and and by carving this, you are making a public statement like um, um, about your, your, your family's heritage and your identity. So for me, the second site is Abilemno, because there's many other sites with Petri symbols that are cool, uh, dating from as early as the 4th, 5th century, right oh, up to yeah. the 10th, 11th. But this this one um, is, is brilliant. And it speaks, obviously, Scotland, the Scots, the Gaels, subsume the Picts. And so the myth is that the Picts are all killed off or destroyed by the, right. the Gaels or the Vikings. But in actual fact, most people, in terms of genetics and in terms of culture, most people... We are just kind of... More, yeah. It, it, the Picts didn't disappear or go away. They just became Scottish as, as the... Yes, as everybody else. The Western dynasties took over, yes. uh, um, which does confuse some Scots because some national, very hyper nationalistic Scots um, struggle with the idea that Scotland in this period has Anglo Saxons, Welsh people, in other words, Brythonic speaking Cumbric peoples, it has yep. um, Picts, and only a small part of Scotland has actual Scotty people from Ireland originally who were speaking Gaelic. And of course, by the 9th, 10th century, you have Scandinavians too. So the the area of Northern Britain that we now call Scotland was a mix of different peoples in this time. And it's, you can't just focus on only one of them. No, no, it's not just the Celts. It's not just the Picts. It's not just this or that. It's, you know, there's so a, whole, I thought that'd be... yeah. a whole group. <laughs> yeah. So I thought I'd start off with a prehistoric site that's reused in the Pictish period, then a Pictish site. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very fascinated with the Picts because, like, if we could find a Rosetta Stone for for all the stuff that they left, yeah. Oh, you talk well, we about. Do, we do have some Pictish language in Ogham or Ohm, as it's called in Ireland, mm. which is a, um. a another script that is being created on the edges of the Roman world in Ireland and spreads with Gaelic speakers around the Irish Sea. And some Picts start okay. using it, inscribing it on monuments. And they're putting up again when they do have it, it's commemorative formula. So it's it's. Um, Jonathan is the father of, you know, um, David or whatever. Not those names, but, you know, something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just... Basic, simple formula. So, you know, we think these monuments are commemorative. It'd be wonderful if we could we could decode, as you say, with the Rosetta Stone. But a few of them do, do have small Ogham inscriptions on them, too, suggesting that there was an audience that didn't know what the picture symbols meant, but did know what Ogham or Ohm said. Right. Wow. It's a it's a really fascinating topic, and I can only give you a brief introduction, but it, it blows my mind. These these stones, they are so be- they're beautiful, but also intriguing because they're obviously communities that had a rich Christian heritage. By this point, they were they were aware yeah. of they were they were fully connected in they weren't so this idea of celtic christianity somehow not connected into the the european world these communities in northern scotland were fully trading and had priests going to rome they were fully connected in but they did their own thing <laughs> yeah yeah i mean christianity was although it was in turkey it was everywhere at this point and it was varied everywhere because there was, yeah. there was we, we have a lot of scholars talk about it being Christianities. And that's not as, as we see on TikTok with scholars, Bible scholar Dan McClellan and people like that. They're all constantly emphasizing the 
the variability and fluidity of practice and belief. Yes, there's core ideas that emerge and evolve, but communities are doing a lot of very different things. Yes. <laughs> Even within the islands of Britain and Ireland, you know. Absolutely. And, and also the idea that, you know, that when Rome got there, that it was just nothing but a war and then nothing but a genocide and nothing no. but this, nothing but that, nothing. When when the reality is, is that, yeah, Rome met a, <laughs> Rome met a people that wasn't necessarily as uh, easy to conquer, but um, ultimately, like, it wasn't a one it wasn't a genocide well a lot of the time they're encountering people who are already christian but they wouldn't they you know from, exactly. a, from a centralized church perspective they're not christian enough you know it's like the, like all these things it's about different degrees we always know the people that want to try and uh you know assert their authority by saying well you're doing everything i would have done but here's just one thing that's wrong everything let's start again now you're converted hang on but i was a christian already you know well you are now exactly. okay <laughs> and so you have this you do i do wonder whether of course we know that christianity is influencing the late roman world so that we're looking at hundreds of years of exposure if not Exactly. actual practice of christianity i'm not saying there aren't people who would we call pagan there's probably lots of people conducting oh, yeah, yeah. there's evidence of that yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but i think we're looking at the complex blending of ideas and practices yeah and that's and, and that's that's what that's my third site as well because i wanted to head down the east coast into england and and tell you about rudston the rudston monolith which is another of mary ann ocketer's um um sites um, I think it's type 13 in her guide. I'm just going to hop to it so I can remind myself. Um, but yeah, so Rudston is Britain's largest surviving monolith. And it's probably prehistoric, but it sits right next to a Norman church in a churchyard. And since the 18th century, it's been capped by a little, given a little lead cap to try and the church thought, oh, we want to keep our massive stone um, um, protected from the elements but it's it's a prehistoric stone that's been raised at least three and a half thousand years it's called the ruds the rude stone the rudston that it the whole the whole settlement is named after the stone because in old english right. it means the the cross stone and we think it may have originally been by the when christians got there they put a cross on top of it it's so huge it looks slightly less um phallic and, uh, and and it became the but it's it was basically a pre-Christian monument that's become Christianized at some point, and it's so famous and so big that everyone just calls it the cross stone. Uh, it may have had a, a cross painted on it rather than on top of it, but um, and it sits right in the churchyard now, so it looks. Yes, and, and in the middle of a cemetery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's and what's really cool about it is it probably was erected like the Clava Cairns, late late Neolithic, early Bronze Age. And the landscape around it is packed full of prehistoric monuments, including cursus monuments, henges, uh, lo um, long, you know, uh, round barrows. And but this one, uh, it looks like long before the church was there, this was already a really important location at the at the hub of all of the ceremonial roots of people living in the Yorkshire Wolds and um, you know coming together seasonally. And at some, you know, why not if you're Christianizing this area? why not you know stick your church right there right next to exactly that. right next to this yeah famous spot that people's going to come see and like it's and it's a, it's it symbolizes what you were actually talking about john when you were saying about you know what no in the early middle ages christians were not like um, iconoclasts ripping everything down the tv show the last kingdom which the 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 film has has athelstan king of the saxons in the in the early 10th century ripping down these ancient monuments where they're blaspheming against our lord and all this, mm -hmm. stuff. So this is all victorian nonsense you know christians weren't doing that most christians were going well if you're worshiping around that big massive stone why don't we just do the same thing and I'll just put a little cross beside it and 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 we'll just keep going. And the, that's, that's the way you get people <laughs> right. on board. You know, the missionaries that did otherwise don't last very long. And we certainly have some examples of those from the early Middle Ages where missionaries just come in, rock in with their henchmen, uh, kill a few people and say, you're going to do it the Christian way now. And do you know what? Surprise, surprise. They're usually ambushed in the next next few months. Oh, look, he accidentally fell on that spear. Oh, never mind. <laughs> you know, you know, you've got to be, you know, you've got to, you've got to, you know, so most of these sites, they speak of that 
complex blending that we were talking about. So that's my third favorite site, Rudston. <laughs> it's over 25 feet tall, which is 7.6 yeah. meters. 7.6 um, meters, yeah. Yeah, 7.6 meters. And it's, uh, it's, got, it's, got, it's currently, they capped, uh, let's see, it says in 1773, a stone cap was placed on the top. Yeah, and that's was, the little Ned one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Cool, eh? So it looks like they've been trying, and it says even uh, possible dinosaur footprints are in the area. Is that? I don't know about the relationship with that to it, but uh, that yeah, there's there's a lot of. I mean, I don't think it would have anything to do with the thing, but just the the area. It's a great area. I mean, if anyone's visiting the UK and York is a very well-known tourist destination, but if you can hire gorgeous. a car or get out into the Yorkshire Wolds. Some amazing archaeological sites, that, and because I've, I'm restricted to twelve, I can't tell you about any of the others. We've got to head south even further. But I, no, I just keep thought going I to, south. Yorkshire would not forgive me if I didn't give one site from Yorkshire in my top twelve. That's true. My wife, for example. <laughs> so they're, 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 all, they're all a bunch of. They want to be independent of the rest of. The, now you say Yorkshire. That's how you Yorkshire. say it. Yorkshire. Yeah, Yorkshire. So we would say Yorkshire. Yeah, Wait. yeah. Uh, it's, it's a sort of standard uh, British, you know, you share, you share. In, in, particularly in the southwest, it's shire, sure. But, you know, I say, I, I'm from Berkshire. But if you spoke with a Berkshire accent, it'd be Berkshire. It sounds more, it's kind of like a southern accent for us. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, the people up north will say Louisville or Louisville. Or when yeah. us in the south, it's Louisville. <laughs> well, absolutely. Dialects in the UK are not only so varied, but people argue all the time about them, and I I forget them all the time. So people mock me. Um, so you know, it, it's we just try, everyone's trying their best, but someone's always there to correct you. Sometimes nicely, sometimes not, and my reaction varies depending on how courteous they are. You know, but at the end of the day, these place names will evolve. But I call I call it Yorkshire. I love it, and the church, maybe the whole scenery is just unbelievable from what i'm seeing and i'll throw some up on the screen here so that everybody else can but oh i hope um, so it's, it's a wonderful site that would not be that would not be a wasted trip <laughs> and there's so many other beautiful churches and prehistoric monuments in the area it's a fantastic part of uh, yorkshire it's really wonderful it's all chalk uplands you see it's very different from the yorkshire moors it's very different yeah. from um um, other parts of Yorkshire, so uh, South Yorkshire, West Yorkshire, North Yorkshire, all very different landscapes. Yeah. Right. So are we moving to number five? Is that where we oh, are? For number four, I thought we have we number, number four, four. Number four. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So I thought we would head down the east coast, following the sort of clockwise route of Marianne Ockerter, and and a site that she addresses, which is Sutton Hoo. And I could mm. tell you so much about Sutton Hoo, but I shall try and keep it short. Sutton Hoo is an internationally famous site. And it's famous um, because it has produced the excavations area just before the Second World War in 1938 and 1939. There were later excavations in the 60s and the 80s and 90s and the noughties. But the most famous find ever, and it's an icon of British his archaeology, is the Mound One helmet from Sutton Hoo, which is a, um, a, a from Mary Ann's, Ann's book here, which is in the British Museum. It, uh, they never dug this up looking like this. This is a this is about ten yeah. years worth of conservation to try and piece back the jigsaw to cry and they got it wrong once and pulled it all apart again and started again. Oh um, no! This is this is as close as we have it, and it's an icon of Britain's past, but actually it's most likely made in southern Scandinavia in the uh, very end of the sixth or early seventh century. And and there was, was a lot more in... items found with it, right? Oh yeah. So it's it's yeah. most famous for Mound One which was excavated in the second year of excavations in 1939 by Basil Brown and then an inter, a, a national team of, of prominent archaeologists brought in to help him because he found a 31 metre long rowing boat oh. buried yeah. in the mound and at the centre a chamber and in the chamber the richest burial ever found from British soil. And it dates to, the as I said, the, the very early 7th century and the 
the, the common interpretation is oh, it's the God. burial of a pagan king of East Anglia, and people have even speculated it is the name of the historical king who's recorded by the venerable Bede as an apostate who adopts Christianity and goes, his wife says, bad idea, dude, and he goes, all right then, and uh, he gives up on the idea, but the king is Radwald, and so we often call Mound One the burial of King Redwald of East Anglia. This is long before there was an England, and he was king of a, an emerging kingdom called East Anglia, the Eastern Angles, who were still pagan but were dabbling in Christianity. And um, it's not a one burial alone. There's a um, up to 19 burial mounds on the ridge above the river, and they all have different kinds of burial. Some of them by cremation, some of them inhumation. But the only only two haven't been robbed, and this, and this is one of them. And so wow. Sutton Hoo, there's so much to talk about Sutton Hoo, but for me what's yeah. important is that it's a famous site. You can go and visit it. It's got a visitor centre. There's a cafe. There's a, You can walk around the burial mounds. The burial mounds don't survive only as small little humps. They're not impressive. But because we've excavated these mounds, They've been robbed before, but we've worked out the story and we can tell you about the burial rites of the East Anglian kings before they formally adopt Christianity. And there's a there's so much more to say. There's other burials that have been excavated. There's also prehistoric remains from the site, of course. And, you know, there's there's other things to say. But for me, and something to do is one of the top 12. You can find a lot of free free information about this particular site oh, yeah. on your WordPress Oh, yes, I've done blog posts about it, my Archeodesk yes. site. I, if I've, you Google and scroll down, your selfie <laughs> is right beside the treasure. Yes, yes. I, I thought, uh, you know, the, the, the tradition of doing selfies with uh, museum exhibits, I just had to do it. You know, what, what, you know, you just have to do it, you know. Well, you it's, made it's... Google search. You made the Google <laughs> ser image search. Oh, you mean I'm on the main Google page? Yes, yes. <laughs> I googled the the Sutton Who treasure and I'm scrolling, and uh, five rows down, uh, Archeodeath WordPress.com, and it's your selfie with that helmet. Well, the thing is, it's a really weird site because the grave goods from Mound One are called the treasure, and I've done a recent research paper arguing we should stop calling it treasure because it was legally never treasure because to be treasure you had to make the argument that it had. Um, it, it, it was buried to be retrieved and it wasn't it was a, it was it was a, a burial site. funeral so it was never legally treasure therefore when it was discovered it was the landowners not the state but she generously gave um it to the british museum so it's not treasure in a legal sense and in the early medieval sense it wouldn't have been treasure so the gold class the purse mount the sword the shield the three spears the lamp the gaming board the mail shirt i could go they on. they would have to pay me they would have to pay well, me it's it's a lot it's a lot of good they stuff would, they treasure. would have to pay me something she was they would have she to was, pay me something she was a very generous lady because I think the state wouldn't have been able to afford it because obviously going through the Second World War. And, oh, um, yeah. Yeah. And it's really interesting. People paper over the fact that the, the Sutton Hoo ship burial was not. Everyone says oh, it was a very patriotic, timely find as Britain was at peril from Germany. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. actually, a lot of archaeologists and a lot of continental archaeologists were spinning it. And Hitler and his cronies who are interested in archaeology big time were spinning it. that Ah, this is further evidence of the shared ancestry of our superior race. You know, there was very much um, they were called. And in fact, it's really sketchy. Look at the original reports from 1939. T.D. Kendrick for the British Museum is calling it a, a fabulous Teutonic grave. And, mm. you know, I'm not saying that these British archaeologists were, you know, on the, I don't know what their politics were, but all I'm saying is that even facing off against Nazi Germany, uh, British society wasn't as pat, you know the the narrative the gloss we give is that the 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 learned classes the aristocrats of Britain were 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 you know obviously all opposed to this. Uh, no, nah, there was a lot of you know yeah, anyway. I'll leave well, it that there. was that was yeah. why Churchill gave his warning. And that, that, that's why Churchill's warning is so famous is because you, you weren't taking it serious. Yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden it was at your doorstep. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the, the Sutton Who ship burial, 
when in the pre-war year write-ups, it's actually quite disturbing how it was being used by archaeologists across yeah. Europe to sort of hint at a shared affinity that could have fed into politics. That, that were all could've. one yeah. kind of one thing. And now, what do we know about the person who was wearing that mask? Well, this is the thing. From the Count of the Venerable Bede, a century later, he is a, what, a fabulous war leader. He kicks, basically, he's one of the few kings who beats Pender of Mercia, his r pagan rival. And from Bede, who's writing in Northumbria, Pender is, 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 is the nemesis of his ancestors because Pender basically slaughtered two Northumbrian kings in battle, kicked the ass out of the West Saxons. And the only king who could really face up to him, well, there's Quitchelm, who's one West Saxon king, didn't... The, the, the records that we have, such as they are, tell us that he didn't lose battles against Panda, but it doesn't mean he won any. Um, but but he, he means. But he, Redwald um, was renowned as a war leader and his kingdom had um, was kind of geographically protected because of the Fens and of up to the west. So East Anglia is, was more in those days a promontory than it is now. And, and it looks very much like it's tied into the rest of England. But culturally and geographically, East Anglia has always been weird. And I, I say that knowing that East Anglians are going to be listening to this going, Arr! you know, but it's true. You're all weird over there. Everyone teases people about from Norfolk and Suffolk, which is still the counties that preserve the division of the East Anglia and Old, Old English Kingdom, the North Folk and the South Folk. And, and it, they are a separate thing. And so they were geographically very discreet. So they were a culturally distinctive and militarily powerful king. Um, and his time was one. I mean, the last East Anglian king was killed by the Danes. And that was St. Edmund, who was given is beatified as, as St. Yes. Edmund, the martyr. Um, the martyr. And, his, uh, and, and um, of Bury St. Edmund's fame. But, but uh, right up until the ninth century, East Anglia was a major power, economic, social, political power. And and we we have to remember that that England wasn't there yet, and so it's a lovely it's a lovely. Um, it was an idea. Uh, yeah, it was just an idea, and it wasn't even a coherent idea. So no. the the, Ang the kings of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms were often allied with British kingdoms against each other. There was a lot of fluidity in political as well as religious matters in the seventh century. Yeah, people people like to think of it as like it was just English. Yeah, yeah. Oh, drop my headphone. People like to think of, you know, it was always just English. It was first Roman, and then it was just, you know, the leftover Romans made England. But that's not, that's not at all. It was, it was fast. All these little pockets of power and struggle and war. Absolutely. And, yeah, Absolutely. it wasn't just right. this instantaneous king. Oh, I'm the king of England. Like, it wasn't this at all. I mean, in many ways, England's formation is an accident and wouldn't have probably happened if it hadn't been for the, the, the Danes uh, kicking out all of the other kings um, so right. that uh, West, the West Saxons were the last last one standing. Which is, yeah, that, that's, a, that's another story, though. That's, that's two another centuries story. In the, that's two and a half centuries in the future from the time of Redwald. But it's, it's an interesting... It's an interesting story, nonetheless, that to think of a, a time before England when we have these archaeological traces of a, a burial site of people experimenting with different ways of... Yes. Of, of, uh, and, of course, now it's the focus of a Netflix film, The Dig, um, which is a yes. fictional version of the, the discovery of the... Which has got issues with it. It's wrong in, in, in detail, but it, it's a, it's at a this wonderful point, film. At, at this point, everything Netflix does is like History Channel quality. Like, oh, there's nothing, course. there's nothing credible as far as historically. I mean, yeah, but I, this is actually, if you know, compared with the Ancient Aliens nonsense and the, um, sorry, the uh, Graham Ancient Hancock um, and all that stuff, this is a really Cave of Bones. well represented d depiction of the 1930s in Britain. So you know, compared, oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's so I, I just got to take your, you know count your blessings really that they got they got that right you know good good because they have been striking out oh yeah yeah it's very poor very poor I'm fair, it's... now we're, we're not you know the the big the big bucks and the big profile oh no we just yeah. aligned with the, the mean academics yeah we're so cruel nasty so cruel. people we're totally nasty we're... <laughs> totally nasty. They hate everybody. Close the education system. <laughs> yeah. So that's my fourth site. That was your fourth. 
So, number five. The whole number hand. five, we're going down to the southeast of England, to Kent, and to the Ooh. Roman city of Canterbury, which becomes the Anglo-Saxon capital of the another Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Kent. Kent was its own kingdom. Um, its foundation myths suggest it was founded by Jutes rather than Angles or Saxons, but it's probably more complicated than that, as things always are outside of the the, the legends. But the the building I want to talk about this is the only church in my list. It's a it's a church, and it, Marianne Ockerto includes it because it's St Martin's in Canterbury. Because this is a church that we can trace back, and it's 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 convincingly the earliest church built in Britain that's still in use mm. because it's um, it was founded as the church of Queen Bertha who was a Frankish princess who was married to King Ethelbert of Kent who is the first king to convert to Christianity and but but while he was still being a pagan she brought her bishop over she set up this church it was it was probably a Roman mausoleum or temple and she, or even actually it could have been a Roman church, you know, fourth century church, but it had been abandoned and it's restored. And the structure is still made of Roman yeah. um, masonry and tile. So that's you can a tell. story. It you has to be in my top 12. Sorry. You can very much tell. It's, it's, it's stunning. Yeah. I mean, and it even is. just the, the town in general uh, it has so many castles and the, oh. there's you could spend you could have 10 sites just from that just from that town i mean canterbury as a site um the cathedral the it's, the, you know, the, the abbeys you know it, it's you know but i'm just trying to keep it simple but you know yeah right. you go to canterbury the entire city is saturated like my city of chester where i am at the moment where my university right. is you know saturated with 2000 years plus of history and archaeology and so yeah St Martin's church has to be mentioned and that's my kentish ref um number 5 <laughs> number 5 and at this time pause for this commercial break portable mobile tv repair you are up to bat Right, number six. We're gonna go. Six. I have to do it. I have to do it. Stonehenge. I'll I'll let you slide. Make it make it count. Make it count. So Marianne Okita includes Stonehenge. How could she not? Stonehenge, of course. But it is the last list. on her list. It is the last thing covered. <laughs> well, for me, Stonehenge is a famous world famous prehistoric yes. site i've so been there oh good it's and it's it sits in a rich landscape of surviving prehistoric monuments and it what does. people forget is the main reason that landscape is so well preserved is because of the british military because salisbury plain is the largest military training area so in the not exclusively but for the training leading up to the and during the first world war in the Second World War and ever since, that landscape has been protected from more intensified farming, which is mechanised farming, which has destroyed so many of our monuments by the fact the military want to f fire things at it, drive yeah. the tanks over it. So it, it seems ironic that 
even that, historically, that area has a lot of military because Shaftesbury, just 45 minutes away, was one of the last strongholds of of King Alfred the Great, right? Oh, absolutely. So it was a military landscape, and it's a very yes. pivotal land. It's a really good point you make that um, say that because Salisbury Plain, the, it's, it's the happenstance that it becomes a upland military training area is is the reason why there's so much good archaeology there. But even Stonehenge, they were thinking of knocking it down because it might be getting in the way of an airfield. The, the, one of the first Royal Flying Corps airfields is right next to it. Wow. And they were actually serious discussions in, in wow. the First World War about knocking it down because it might have been a, a, an impedance to low-flying aircraft. But my point is, we have the luck of its survival, but you're right. Salisbury Plain is actually on the water catchment between the east of the country and the mm. west of the country. It's on the divide. And Therefore, all of the rivers east of it go go towards the North Sea. All the rivers west of it f flow down to the Bristol Channel and out to the Irish Sea and the Atlantic, right? And so, militarily, that landscape was important, and people through time recognised that. So, yes. Stonehenge was a monument built during the third millennium BCE. Um, three phases. I won't go through all the details, but started off as a circular monument. The henge bit is actually the bank and ditch. It's nothing to do with the stones. Right, it's so nothing to do. Uh, the, the henge archaeological term it's henge, around it. now refers to a bank and ditch, usually yes. the wrong way around for defences with the ditch on the inside. But Stonehenge is weird and it's the wrong way around, so it doesn't even fit the pattern. It's almost like archaeologists don't use the right terms. Um, but, the, but the stone circle may have actually been around just inside that bigger henge. But then later, more stones were added, and it's a complex monument. You have the blue stones from West Wales, and then later the, the, the trilithons are made, and other stones are from uh, the Marlborough Downs, closer. Mm -hmm. And now we have the evidence that the altar stone may have come from uh, Scotland, Scotland, right? Yeah. from the area beyond the Clavacan. So there's another story there. But for me, the reason why Stonehenge is very cool, though, is... Must have been aliens, because those are too heavy to carry. <laughs> Sorry, that was my noise of of physical pain. At the I went to no. Joe. I, I tapped in my Joe Rogan on you. No, it's obviously, mate. It, no, obviously, John. It was it was Merlin. Merlin uh, floated mm. them in from Ireland. Oh, yeah, with his mind. He tells just... us that Merlin floated them in from Ireland. Um, so that's fact because I imagine it in my head, and therefore it yeah. must be true. And I'm saying it's it the easiest, easiest, easiest explanation. This is literally a podcast. I'm a man. I'm talking on a podcast. It's true. You know, that's the it's way it true. works. In the world. <laughs> no, but seriously, um, later legend by Jennifer Monmouth and other has a fable that it's an ancient burial site of the kings of Britain and it was constructed by Merlin. Right. OK, but we know that's nonsense. What really interests me, though, is that in the 1920s, they found some burials at Stonehenge that are nothing to do with prehistory, but are again early medieval. And it looks like. In the Anglo-Saxon period, before Geoffrey of Monmouth made up this fairy story of Merlin, mm -hmm. the, the, the Anglo-Saxons saw this, like the Picts were burying at Clavacans, the Anglo-Saxons were burying at Stonehenge, but they weren't burying honoured ancestors at Stonehenge. No, they were using Stonehenge as an execution site. And, and the place name Stonehenge, one possible origin story for it is that it means the stone the drop, gallows the drop the stone hinge yeah the drop of the stone on the neck so you have like a, a, a representation way to ruin manuscripts. that one <laughs> representations from manuscripts of gallows are two posts with a crossbar so the argument is what the saxons saw this is a stone version of what they would hang criminals from and the the burials we found there don't have evidence of hanging, but they've had evidence of sharp force trauma. In other words, they were forced to kneel down and, and blow to the back of the head. And one of the blows goes through and you've actually got the nick on the mandible. So, so you can see how they were hit with some force that it cut through their mm. neck. And, and, and so these people were either whatever they were, whoever they were at some point. Criminals, people... witches, redheads, who knows? Yeah, well, you know, I don't I don't want to joke about redheads. Hey, hey, I, hey, hey. Some of my best friends are redheaded. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, no, You've got at least one. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But no, my point is that we don't know the categories of who they right. were. But, you know, it's unlikely they just were there 
and got killed. It's most likely no, no. this was a, a public place that was seen as a place of fear and dread and horror and prominent. They've in done the something. Yeah. Those people have the, the rebellion. They've started try to start a rebellion. They've not paid their taxes in ten years. They've killed somebody. They've stolen something. They've they've done something. And Sutton Who had the same later history because. Um, the royal burials there by the late 7th, 8th, 9th centuries were being used as execution sites. So it's almost like these places that had once been seen as famed were now being seen as scary and you associate the damned dead, the, the cursed dead. For you know, And you're cursing them because if you're not giving them a consecrated burial in a Christian sense, you are literally physically excluding them from not only society, but also from the next life. You are It's right. a very stark way of distancing you for well time. and i could see i could see how in the ancient world if there is a basic knowledge that this area is a grave site or was a grave site and you don't know anything about it and there's no way to find out anything about it it could become this like oh it's well let's just take the people there like there we know that there's some sort of this is tied to people being dead anyway so let's I could see how that's a very common way of thinking, like, you know, and America yeah. has thousands of forgotten cemeteries. But this so it's very place, easy. Yeah, this place would have been very prominent. You know, people would have mm -hmm. known about it from all over Britain. We don't know what they called it. Maybe they just called it Stonehenge. But my point is, whatever the associations were with it, people would have known it. It would have been a landmark. People could have described and said they're taking her and him to... Stonehenge, Stonehenge to execute them. So, you know, the idea is it's a prominent public place and we've got that. So there's the story of Stonehenge is about prehistory. But there's again, the reason I love these sites is that they have stories throughout time that we know the Romans right. were going to Stonehenge and doing crazy stuff as well. They looked yes. like they were chipping bits of the blue stone off and, do, and leaving. Maybe they were having cult ceremonies there. But the idea the Druids built Stonehenge is, is definitely disproved. But the people yeah. before the Druids and after the Druids did things there, and that we do know. And people who still think that they are Druids. Oh yes, there's <laughs> there's still lots of Druids, modern Druids who are real. They they have their yes. beliefs. They're, they're as real Everyone as any beliefs. priest, in my opinion. You know, that's but they, true. They're that's not very real true. In the sense of they're not the they're, there's no continuation the, of a. Um, that's what I'm talking faith. about. That's but, what I'm yeah, talking about. Yeah, I know, about. I know, but I, I just sort of. Uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, but they but are yes. as real as all the other mythologies. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. So that's my sixth site. So that gets us to halfway as far as I I count it. If that's okay, <laughs> it's absolutely okay. And uh, what is now number seven? You got to come with a good one for seven, because seven's Almost. that Christians will get mad at you because seven's what? that seven's that 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 key number. My number seven is staying in southern England, but moving a little to the north. And we're not going to deal with Avebury. I'm not including Avebury. It's sad. People get very angry about me. I'm going to the Uffington. You can be in the next one. one. <laughs> Uffington White Horse. Uffington? Now, the Uff How do you say it? Uffington. U -F -F -I -N -G. And this is in the Vale of the White Horse in historically... It's in Berkshire, but now it's in Oxfordshire, and it is on. Uh, it is a. It is what one of our heck? ancient chalk cut hill figures of a horse. Um, there's been speculation that it might be a dragon, but it is thought to now be a horse, but a horse with a beak, a kind of strange beak. And it's like a horse it, with its tongue sticking out. Or is it a representation of its breath? I don't know. But the idea is we now know through optically stimulated luminescence dating, which is dating the buried land surface, that this chalk figure was cut and has been maintained for around... By sheep. <laughs> By oh, sheep no. right now. <laughs> oh, I should have explained. What you need to do is to, they actually have to, to keep it. You have to dig a trench and pack it with chalk. To maintain it so it's not just keeping the grass down to keep it scoured to keep it clear you have to scour it at least every uh, five that. to ten yes. years I see and that. it's been scoured that uh, on that spot for over two and a half thousand years it's, oh, it's, it's really deep age or iron age you that's, a, you, that's a no 
there's on the pictures when you the grass around it is all maintained by sheep. Yes, 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 yes. It's it's pasture land, so it's yes, it's maintained by the National Trust. And the do you expect me not to tie this to aliens? Uh, Look how big this thing is. I have have a helicopter to see it. Ah, well, I would argue that if you're in the valley, out in the valley below, you don't see it the way we do from the air, but you do see the horse because it is on a a tight angle. You don't see it in the same perspective as an aerial shot, but you do see the horse. And when you're on the hill, even if you're on the hill above it, looking down on it on the same ridge, you do see that it's a horse. So yep. it's it's not like a NASCAR planes thing where people have said, mm-hmm. well, you couldn't possibly have done this. It is a topography that is really dramatic. And it's part of a really rich landscape. There's nearby... The Which we know school. how they did that, by the way. We know how they made those things. Yeah. And, oh, and yes, we know in how the, the NASCAR pyramids. planes, yes. Oh yes, yeah, that wasn't yeah. aliens either. Yes, no, so, no, no. But no, they, 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 no, But my point is that you didn't need to be up in the air to identify and right. recognise them. And um, this this monument sits in a rich landscape. You've got Wayland Smithy, which is a Neolithic chambered tomb, just a, three kilometres away. You've got uh, an Iron Age hill fort of Uffington Castle above it. There's a Neolithic tomb that's reused in the Roman period for burial. There's a Bronze Age barrow that's reused in, by the Anglo-Saxons for burial. There's Dragon Hill itself, which is the myth, the the, the legendary site of where uh, St George slayed the dragons. So the that dragons. The dragons which may be actually a human modified hill below the white horse. And there's been speculation about whether that was done in prehistory or was it a temporary Norman Mott and Bailey castle? There's so much not known about that landscape, but the white horse has now been dated to the late bronze age or the iron age. And I know that Oxford archeology span are doing new work to refine the dating of the monument with new field work in 2022 and 2023. So I'm, Looking forward to new news about the Uffington White Yeah, Hills. that'd be exciting. That is a such a cool, just a, such a cool depiction. I mean, it is unique. from all angles, it's so unique. And the way that the front legs come off the hillside and the back yes. legs are, it's just. Um, and, been... and from the front, you know, the two things coming down to me, that just looks like. Probably the horse in cold British winter blowing yes. steam from his nose. That's what I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Josh Pollard has written a paper claiming it's to do with sun cult and the way the sun would rise and set behind it. And this mm. could be linked to that. I don't, I don't, I don't want to go there. All I would say is that everyone was so desperate for this to be Saxon because Ash, the Ashdown, the downs above Uffington, is one of the sites that the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle records that Alfred the Great beat the Danes um, in a battle around an ash tree and it became subsequently the ash down. And so everyone's trying to say, oh, maybe the Saxons put this up as a war memorial. And everyone's been so desperate for this to be a Saxon chalk figure. And now we know it's not. It's late Bronze Age or Iron Age, which is the, the wrong way round for the next one, which is point, um, best uh, my favourite number eight. All right, favorite number eight. Favorite number eight. So if you shake the eight ball, what does it say about your favorite number eight? We're going eight? down to Dorset to another hill figure. I'm going to stay okay. with another hill figure. This is the other famous hill, well, one of the other famous hill figures from Britain. It's called the Cern Giant, and it's a bit naughty because the Cern Giant has uh, is a n- n- male figure. It's the is the most obvious thing to say because of a very prominent clearly. I can't put that up here. I can't put that up here. That so my get problem, us... I don't make the rules. <laughs> I don't... We have a very prominent... Everyone was can he, yeah. the Cern Abbas Did, giant. Is he the inventor of Viagra? Well, he actually has <laughs> got bigger over time. You'll be shocked to hear. Oh, okay. That's not surprising. <laughs> most of the way he looks now is from 1908 or 1909. They made him slightly okay. more... They lengthened him. He used to have a belt... And they incorporated his member into his belt and made it. They taller. need to put the belt back on. Yeah, I think, I think. Oh, you prudish Americans, you know. <laughs> but actually, he's he's world famous and and a focus of fun and so on. But people have had different theories over the years about what the CERN Abbas giant is. So why is people, his nipples crooked? Isn't that? 
Isn't everyone that way? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Is that an English trait? <laughs> it's, yes. It's, I'm going to make up a myth now because this will then go viral. Yes, genetically, all English people have... No, no, I don't know. I don't know. Large <laughs> sided. Yeah, <laughs> lopsided nipples. It's it's a thing. Oh, no, wow. I don't know. Okay. So, so the, the people have speculated. Here we go. Uh, this is going to be a quick run through. People said it's a prehistoric fertility deity. He, it's a Roman representation of Hercules, or it's a early modern representation of Hercules, or it's a joke parodying James the Charles the Second or James the First. I think James the First. But people haven't known. We haven't known how old it is. It's 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 only first recorded, I think, in the very beginning of the 18th century, um, and drawn and reported during the mid to late 18th century. Okay. And people have said, oh, oh, there's all sorts of been mad ideas about it. But the fact is, it's recently been excavated and dated, and it is later Anglo-Saxon. Oh wow! So it dates to the Christian Anglo-Saxon period. And one idea is that it was a, one idea that's just been published by Tom Morecambe and Helen Gittos is that it's it was originally made to be Hercules as a war monument, as a kind of military landmark for Anglo-Saxon armies. And then later became, if you believe it, a representation of the hermit St. Edward, who founded the, the monastery of CERN that was immediately below the giant. So the argument is that this is representing St. Edward. OK, just stay with me. This is what they argue. It's not that I'm, I'm... There's so many jokes going through my head that I'm having to contain myself so badly. <laughs> as a as a sort of wild man in the woods with a staff. And the the, 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 the miracle of St. Edward is that he planted his staff. No, no sniggering. Planted his staff and it it, it, it turned into a tree, a miracle that it turned into a tree. And so maybe what we're looking at here is a representation of St. Edward. So it was originally intended to be Hercules because Hercules, long after the Roman period, was included on, Chris, on, on Germanic art, the Franks, the Saxons. They loved Hercules as a, as, as a legendary figure and then later became St. Edward. But you can take that or leave that. I'm not sure. I did a YouTube video about it where I went through the article and I'm, I was convinced half the time and unconvinced other times. So, but that's we're still trying to work out what it means that the Cern Abbas giant is medieval or early medieval Anglo-Saxon, not prehistoric, not Roman, not 16th century, 17th century. I mean, it gets it's like what the Holy Spirit looked like when it visited Mary. I mean... You've said it, so it's true. We're just making history in this podcast. We're just, I we're mean, just, it's, it's we're making things happen. It's, 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 if we say it, it, it's the way it was. Wow. I was not expecting this to be in England. We're very prim and proper. That, that, is, that is impressive. I mean, and what's the point of the giant crooked club? I mean, because you got to admit, this looks like a six-year-old did it in a way. Like, yeah, I mean, um, I, the I, club... I would say we don't know. I mean, now it's under short grass and it's cut white. We don't know if originally there were bushes and there were other features that augmented it. You know, we, we assume okay. you know, so... it's like many things with art and art. You know, we assume the way it's come down to us is the way it originally was. I mean, I don't know. All I would say yeah. is it's unique and there are th- definitely if unique. It's, if it's Hercules that's adapted into St. Ed- Edward. Ethwold, um, it's certainly got no parallels, so it's crazy. But it's famous. Now, what is directly above it? Because may, okay. it, maybe that's new, but, but in, on the there side, is, like when you're looking there at is the a picture. There's fortification of unknown date called the Trendle. And that's okay. part of the problem, is if we knew what that was, maybe we'd understand something It would give us like a key. Time. But we don't okay. know. It could be an Iron Age. It could be a little uh, walled garden from the late associated with the late medieval priory. There's all manner of guesses. Okay. Now, has that been excavated? It went, and then there's just no information. So. Okay. So that's just one of those things that's on the list for yeah, it's on a list. for people it's a like you. Monument, but no one's got around to doing anything with it. And that's probably because of finances, most likely. Absolutely. That's typically the story. Yeah. Wow, that is a good number seven. You like it. You're okay with that. Oh, that, that was number eight, that was, wasn't it? Seven was that? Yeah, was number eight. eight. That was lucky four. eight. That was lucky eight. Are we, do we have time for four more? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, okay. I don't have a time limit, and uh, when I put it on TikTok, I can split it up into two videos. May I proceed to number nine for you? Absolutely. Nine is fine. Nine is fine. Tintagel in Cornwall. Tintagel, a coastal promontory um, that is, again, I've got a bit of a bias towards early medieval sites. I haven't actually got any Roman sites in my top 12. There's plenty of cool Roman sites, but this is just post-Roman. So this is, again, early medieval. And in Cornwall, we wouldn't call them Anglo-Saxon because they're Brythonic speakers. They're Celtic language speakers, uh, a language that is, is allied to Welsh. And this is a dramatic peninsula into the into the Atlantic which um, is a post-Roman trading site and citadel. We've got a defensive ditch. It traces over 100 buildings. It's the only place you can go in Britain and see stone-built early medieval structures, you know, and you can walk amongst them. And it was probably a seasonal citadel of the kingdom of Dumnonia or possibly a separate kingdom of oh, Kurnow, wow. the Cornish. And it's by the... 11th 12th century it becomes legendarily associated as the birthplace of arthur um so it it enters into arthurian legend and the late medieval castle built there it's you know we think of car medieval castles built for military purposes the castle seems to have been built to tap into the legend of arthur so the 13th century castle is kind of trying to make the the the, the legend real by putting a castle in the site where they probably saw the old traces of a, a, a dark age, early medieval citadel and wanted to make it into a new um, Earl uh, Richard Earl of Cornwall made it into his um, into like a fantasy castle. Right. You know, yes, it's defensible, but it was also um, not in any way following mod the, the 13th century military architectural optimization strategies. It's right. About, precarious site to build a castle and his motive was probably because he wanted a castle to tap into the legend he, he wanted to see if the magic was real yeah yeah so that's my ninth site and it's very that cool is a, it's an english heritage a, run site it's one of the top sites to visit it's got a and all the standing bridge. stones in that area are, are amazing Oh, yes. And the churchyard there has found evidence yeah. of early medieval burials. So, again, the yes, church, I'm looking at that now. So Materiana's church, which is on the mainland opposite the peninsula, has had excavations and they've got evidence of early medieval graves there. So that has been a long term Christian site because these Western kingdoms were Christian earlier than the Anglo-Saxons. So they were continuing the Roman tradition of Christianity from the 4th century through the 5th, 6th, 7th centuries. And they were connected. We've got trading evidence of pottery and glass showing that they're still oh. maintaining the trade links with Western Gaul, with, with, with Aquitaine and with Iberia. And all the way, objects are coming from the Eastern Mediterranean, from the Byzantine world in the 5th and 6th centuries. So these people were on the edge of Britain, but because they had tin and they had other rich resources, people were traveling a long way to trade with them. Yeah. And what, the way that this castle looks, Cornwall's castle, is kind of rounded and it has almost an Aladdin looking top. Was that top ten originally, or was was it always oh, I stone? Know. I don't know about that. Which one are you looking at? Are you looking at Launston Castle? Cornwall's ancient ruins. I don't know which one you're talking about. Restorable? Let's see. Oh, well, no, it's Saint Ma Saint Mars. Never mind. Okay. All oh, right. No, no, that's uh, no, but that's later anyway. Yeah. I, I, yeah, that's um, that's Google for you. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right it's all right it's just it's just trying to but i just tintagel's in my top 12 because it's a famous early medieval dark age fortress i use the hot scare quotes dark age because we don't really use that term anymore but um what was the obsession with arthur like what what why has this carried on for so long okay. and why is people still looking for him him and merlin like what 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 is this i know there's like treasure that's out there and like so our theory and legend has been captivating people and my, my uh, um for a long time and the idea is of a warrior king who fought against the saxons you know inheritor of rome he captures so much of the mystique of these centuries when the the roman province is broken up and societies are seen to be more 
tribal, more fragmented. Yeah. And so Arthur fits into this story and he has for centuries as this um, warrior. He probably wasn't real. And if he was real, he's probably the amalgam of five or six different dudes. And uh, but that's not really the point. He captures the imagination in the same way as a Ragnar Lothbrok does. There's no evidence yes. of a historic Ragnar Lothbrok, but mm -hmm. he is like a Viking in popular perception. It's the yeah, same yeah, kind yeah. of thing. Oh, uh, okay. We can thank Disney and the Sword and the Stone. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Wow. That's that's because I've always wondered that because I know there's no I, like I've never I've looked and I'm like what what is this. Arthur, where did he, there, there's no, he's kind of like Moses, like there's no evidence out there for him whatsoever. Well, he is, and and this links to the next site, which is um, my number 10, which is Glastonbury Tour and Glastonbury Town, which is again associated with the legend of the Holy Grail, associated with Arthurian myth, but it's real, it's real archaeology, though there's fragments in it, it's, 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 it's even more bizarre, uh, because that is the site where the monks dug up Arthur and Guinevere basically to enhance their pilgrimage trade, their proto medieval tourist trade. And so they, they wanted, they needed relics to rival other competitor um, pilgrim sites. And the, wow. it was one of the wealthiest Benedictine abbeys in the country. And the town grew up around it, around this iconic, at uh, the base of this iconic hill, which is natural, but modified of Glastonbury Tor. But it, totally. it's, we, we do have evidence, while we don't know about the legends, you know, the legends are all nonsense, we do know that this was a very important early Christian site from the 5th, 6th century, and, and it continued through the Saxon period as a powerful, important uh, Somerset um, uh, holy site. And so yeah. while there are, it is, there's legendary glosses, there is a genuine deep time history to the, the landscape. Is. The, the hill, I mean, the hill definitely looks like it was uh, human enhanced because of the way it's laid out. But like that's, that's what I mean. It's gorgeous for one. What's left of it? Um, when was this built again? So the abbey, um, uh, the Benedict, the abbey ruins date from the. I think mainly. I mean, I'm guessing here. I've got it in front of me. Twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth centuries. Um, really big wealthy benedictine house but we've excavations a lot of them very terribly bad excavations early excavations done right. badly but we do have archaeological evidence of 7th 8th 9th century 10th century 11th century you know, a, st a deep time story of the community there and nearby there's a place name of um suggesting hinting at a, a british establishment a clan name that's uh, a double l a n clan um, and we, obviously that means a holy site. And so we actually have a, well, a, a, a Welsh name preserved mm. in Somerset close by, which could hint at a, 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 another early church site. So this site was, it became part of the Kingdom of Wessex, but it may have had deep British roots of Welsh speakers in that area who... Right. Um, um, who uh, maintained their Christian traditions after the breakup of Rome. So while all the stuff about Joseph of Arimathea and, uh, and, and, and the Holy Grail is all later garbage, at least this, and there's lots of, you go to Glastonbury today, it's hippie central. It's just full of, you know, um, oh, I can see that. candle shops and, uh, you know, baloney yeah, yeah, yeah. and the festival, obviously. But it's, it's there tourism. is a genuine deep time story there in the landscape beneath all the, the, all the nonsense. I mean, even uh, when I was, you know, when I visited England, you would have restaurants, you know, King Arthur's Cafe, and like there, there's this yeah, yeah. culturally obsess obsession with, with it. And so they say that they unburied. Where did they go after this? Like, if they unburied them here, where'd they put them? <laughs> exactly, and you know. Arth the two Arthurian sites in my list, Glastonbury and Tintagel, are put together because they are. There's many other sites you could go to in the hunt for Arthur, but they're the ones that I would, you know, they're both in popular culture and in genuine evidence are worth connecting to, in my opinion. Gotcha. What is the best argument for a real Arthur? 
None. There's no. There's no. There's no compelling. There's not even slightly interesting. It's all garbage, and it attracts. Um. This is the problem. While say Archie Wolf and my American colleagues are constantly fighting against the erasure of indigenous history, and that is always going to be more important on a global scale. In my field, in the islands of Britain, one of the most insidious and most um, fundamentalist of pseudo archaeologists are the, author- are the Arthurian for, um, um, characters. Right. And they are really they can be they can be very aggressive and very fervent in their hatred of academics who dismiss Arthurian legend. But the Frank we did we're working in the early Middle Ages. We're working from legends and fragmentary sources. And if you if you don't have even the most basic of training and understanding those sources, you're not going to even make the slightest bit of headway. And you need the linguistic skills. You need to understand the context in which they're written, how they're reproduced, how they're often reinterpreted. And if you, it's only by the most naive of simplistic readings, equivalent to biblical literalists, you know, that kind of, I'm just using that as an analogy. I, I don't know. No, it's a very accurate one. You know, um, it's only that way. Can you even get close to a real Arthur? And the, the question I would say is what for, why do you want this? What, what we know so little about this period. And yet the archeology span is telling us some really exciting stories about citadels and fortifications and trade and settlements and holy sites. That's cool. Why do you have to keep on trying to latch onto Arthur? Because it's lazy, stupid, old-fashioned, and dumb. It's like chasing Bigfoot. It. It's like yeah. chasing Bigfoot. It's like chasing Bigfoot. Yeah, it doesn't. And even if there was a Bigfoot out there, who cares? Let leave yeah. him alone. Let him. Let, let Josh. Him let Josh Gates go do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for me, Arthurian types are are are. It's not just that they're they're fantasies, but they're dangerous fantasies because they rob. They rob they, again. They they don't erase indigeneity in the same way, but they are disrespecting the traditions of what we do have and the archaeological sites we do have. They're 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 peddling nonsense. And of course, it there's a cross. I'm sure somewhere there's a cross reference to the other different br- br- brands of pseudo archaeology. Um, but it it's it's quite insidious. Yeah, yeah, and, and that always frustrates me because. Like, th- just looking through these sites, so you can begin to see the swirl uh, of how all of it began to connect and all of it began to come together. And to me, that's m- much, much, much more interesting looking at those and looking at the timelines and seeing how all these people groups mesh together to make what we now know is far more interesting than chasing some ghost of Christmas past. Exactly. You know? Exactly. So, I think we're at, is this 10, or was that 11, 10? 11 and 12. 11 and 12. I have been ignoring the most, what the, the best part of Britain is, of course, Wales, where I live, and I work on the edge of it, and so my last two sites are into Wales, and there's many wonderful sites in Wales, and again, my bias is showing because we're gonna, I'm going to pick two early medieval sites, but again, I've picked sites to have deeper time stories. So my first site is Margam in South Wales. M-A-R-G-A-M. And Margam is a later medieval Cistercian monastery. There's beautiful ruins of a later medieval monastery. Gorgeous. But the, the, the thing that captures me is that over time in the area, um, obviously this area is well known for its industrial heritage, its important steelworks at, at Port yep. Talbot is still a major discussion point in the Welsh economy. Um there's so much rich industrial heritage. I'm my family are from South Wales. This is close to my roots, um, and it was you know I don't take much truck in it, but I went down there during the COVID pandemic. No, legally, no, I didn't break any rules, but du- during the break to, to with social distancing, I was going to see some heritage sites, and a local guy goes, "Ah, oh, I saw you last week," and he thought I was local. <laughs> I was like, "No, no, mate." <laughs> it's like my my family came from here in the 1930s. You know. <laughs> Um, it was really weird. But anyway, so I'm going off, off track. So my point is Margam is a later medieval monastery and there's later industrial heritage in the area. But for me, what's important is the collection of early medieval stones that are now housed in a small Victorian schoolhouse near the Abbey ruins. And it's a wonderful collection of the early medieval crosses 
and inscribed stones that take us on a journey from the 5th, 6th century with Latin inscribed stones and a reused Roman milestone through to Christ Christian crosses and some amazing 10th, 11th century um, elaborate carved crosses. And these are the only traces of what was probably the predecessor to the latest Cistercian Abbey. There's probably an early Welsh church here, very wealthy, well-connected, and the styles of the art show connections with Ireland, but also with the Saxons. So this was probably the Welsh were in the sort of um, the pivot between the Saxon world and the Celtic world. This is the and, connection. Yeah, yeah, their monasteries were. So the cross of Aineon, um has an inscription in, 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 in uh, Latin. The cross of Christ, Aineon for the soul of Guarest had this made we don't know anything about these individuals beyond these inscriptions and my favorite one is the cross of Conbelin, um which is see that one. absolutely huge cross and remember these would have all originally been vividly painted in white black green red yellow so they would have looked like um metalwork they would have looked like a piece of glorious metalwork but on a scale and some of them have, not these, but some of them have traces of metal fittings. So they would have glinted and shone and they would have had gilding. Yeah, yeah. It showed the wear of the metal across the across the stone. Like the... Yeah, so for me, I, I filmed here, so I'm very proud of this because I haven't been in many history documentaries, but I was filmed at these stones talking about them for a programme called The Story of Welsh Art for, for a Welsh TV. So I was very proud nice. to to be able to because I, I told them where to go and I said of all the sites you should go to you probably won't think of it because there's other sites that are more dramatic but I said go to Margam because you've got stones here that tell a deep time story of centuries of a, of, of a, a, a I know it's all about a, a religious Christian community but that's the only traces we have it doesn't matter what it's about society. yeah so it's the way into those centuries really and so that's my 11th site yeah this one is very cool and <clears throat> Do you know anything about the the Sheila Nagig? Oh, I didn't know if there's one from this site. Uh, from uh, it, it comes up in Margam. It's a little alien-looking thing with um with the feature that the uh, the men on the hillside had. Oh yes, yes. So I know about Sheila Nagig's a late medieval um, church art inscriptions. I didn't know about one from Margam, but we certainly have. <laughs> We have them on a number of churches in Ireland and also in England and Wales. And they, yeah, they are old, supposed to be old crones, but in a very provocative posture, inviting yep. their, inviting people towards them. So one argument is that they're a Christian moral tale. <laughs> um, other people have seen them as perhaps iterations of earlier folk and pre-Christian tradition of 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 a fertility deities i don't know yeah 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 just, but, just you know, evolution some sort of part of the evolution of religion yeah, but throughout the, fact the ages is the medieval church didn't mind putting that graphic, up there graphic stuff that wouldn't go on our tv they had it on their churches yeah 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 there's stuff i can't put on here <laughs> this is why you want to keep talking about it i'm trying to move off that stuff <laughs> well it keeps popping up every time i bring it it's like I think there's something wrong with your Google search, your archaeology yeah, yeah. Google searches. <laughs> oh, it's, hang on, no, 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 it's bringing up me. So, no, 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 it's, it's brilliant, it's good, it's good, yeah. See? <laughs> anyway, so the, the final, wow. sorry about So this that. is kind of like, this is a little bit, in a, in a way, it's the stone version of what would be the Library of Alexander. Like, it is this connection point of all of the, all of the cultures. Absolutely. And my last site is one that I've dug myself, which is the Pillar of Elizeg. Uh, and this is in North Wales. We've gone up to North mm -hmm. Wales and the Pillar of Elizeg is, again, it's a monument with multiple phases. It's a prehistoric, multi-phase curbed cairn. So it's a burial mound. And we found we excavated and found evidence of cremation burials there from the Bronze Age. So wow. not a passage grave like Clava, but a, a multi-phase you know, multiple generations are building this cairn and inserting their dead into little kists. And we confirm that it's long speculated, but we confirm that with our excavations. And then in the in the early ninth century, in what we popularly call the Viking Age, but 
the Welsh were very good at kicking Viking ass, so we don't have much of a Viking age in Wales. Um, a Cambro Nor um what's the, what's the, Cambro Norse, as you could call it, the Cambro Norse age. Anyway, in the in the in the early ninth century, um, this cross was put on the mound, um, commemorating the kings of Powys. And there's a really complicated story there. It's one I'm writing up with my colleague, Professor Nancy Edwards and my other colleague, Dr. Gary Robinson, for publication at the moment. But the short of it is this is a rare example. Unlike the Margam stones, this is on the original location. So we have a frag. We don't have the cross head, but we have the shaft. Mm. No, it's broken off with a long Latin yeah. inscription that is on the original site. And it was clearly placed on a very prominent site on an ancient burial mound to enhance the story it's telling about because the, the Welsh kings here were constantly fighting against their English rivals, particularly the Mercians. And th this is far, not far from Watson offers dikes, which are monuments I can tell you about another time. But so this is, this is a monument that speaks of a beleaguered dynasty who was surrounded by enemies on all sides, but particularly their, the Saxons to the east. And they were erecting this prominent cross on a, on a striking landmark to honour their dynasty. So the Pillar of Elise Egg, um, I excavated from 2010 to 2012, and we're writing it up now. And it's another site that I think sheds light on, you know, how many amazing... It's actually probably the most neglected of all the 12 I've told you about. Very few people know about it. And yet it is nationally, it's not internationally important, as a rare example of a cross on its original location in the British landscape. I mean, it's literally just out in the middle of the field with a fence around it. Like, like there's nothing. It, it looks like it wouldn't be fun to walk to. <laughs> oh, I have to convince you otherwise. But no, seriously, if you ever over, I shall take you to it. But it's it's a it's it actually you're right though, and it didn't even have the fence around it until we started digging and we convinced Cadu that it needed better protecting from the sheep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, but seriously, it it is it's a very it's a very it's a unique monument. And it's it's you can't even see the Latin text on it anymore unless it's in very directed light or at night with a spotlight when you can you pick can out see the it Latin right 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 you can see it in certain pictures where they've edited yeah. the picture to to kind of yeah. highlight it but yeah 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 but the short wow. of it is that is my twelfth and for me because it's local to me and I've dug it it's my favourite but that's two actually two of these sites actually three because I dug at Sutton Hoo as a student it's so actually mm. three of my twelve are sites I've actually spent time excavating so no I'm, I'm biased you know <laughs> people yeah you know, and and this is we can kind of this this kind of brings to like a, a kind of good conclusion to bring some clarity to archaeology people think. You dig a hole in the ground, you look at all the stuff you see, and you know the story. Yeah. Like, they think it's such a quick process of, well, just dig, and you'll know. And yeah. it's like, no, 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 you dig, then you wait, and you test, and you wait, yeah. and you wait, and you dig, and you look, and you study. And it takes years on years on years to build the story accurately around these things it's easy to look at this thing and then make up some sort of story but like to get the actual like truth of these things you said you dug this in 2012 it's 2024 I must admit we should have got the results out sooner but i've got a website with all of our preliminary publications on it project elise egg which i can put a link to for you if you wish mm -hmm. and um, Sec, yeah. my death blog i address it all the time but yeah it's my favorite site and it's i think about, i already have your yeah. blog i think i have your blog in my link tree already for sure well there you are yeah. i'm all archaeology out but with there's hundreds more sites we could do but you know, there we'll is. have to do that another time, but it's been wonderful. <laughs> there is, and uh, I just got the low power signal on my phone, so uh, I my battery's bad on this thing. I got to get a new one. Um, but I appreciate that. That is that is twelve that like I I was aware of. Not all of them, especially the last one, I wasn't aware of. Um. But those are those are that's the good twelve. I mean, I think and... I think you know I would I would say I don't want to overplay it, but you know everyone's got different opinions. But Mary Ann's book has ten out of the twelve. I'm sure. And I will that. I will tag that book. I'll find the link to be able to buy that book and put it in the yeah. Put it in the actually nine description. of them. 
she nine out of twelve she includes. She doesn't include Margum, Pillar of Elise Egg, or Clava. But mm. you know, the point is we're all different archaeologists, we have different criteria, but I just wanted to share with you my 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 I loved it. I loved all of them. These sites. It's this is my favorite thing to do. Um so well thank you for doing what you do because i think it's really important to get it out there and different audiences that wouldn't listen to a boring old uh, british guy but you know you'll be you'll be connecting to so i really appreciate you inviting me on well yeah, i and uh at any time and uh I, and also anyway you know, blah 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 tongue tied here you have a presentation coming up right Oh yeah, what am I doing? I'm doing all sorts of things. I've yeah, we've got a book launch on the twelfth of December. There before it is. Before that, is. next week. Yeah, yeah, next week. Before that, though, I am talking about the importance of digital public engagement for early medieval Wales sites like the Pillar of Elise and Margam. So I'm talking about that. So any feedback I can get, the better. Very good. And then your book is out on December twelfth. Twelfth. Yeah, we'd have a book all launch, right. a digital book launch. So you can you can log on to that for free and join in the discussion it's called the book's called cremation in the early middle ages it's all about burning the dead and it's the first nice. book of its kind with contributors from across northwest europe so we're having a book very launch cool. to celebrate it very cool well i appreciate you coming on and uh everyone watching we will see you next time and there will probably be part two because um england's old